In August of 1965, Dr. King was on vacation <coughs> when he got word that rioting had broken out in the Watts neighborhood of Los Angeles. The riots were sparked by the arrest and beating of yet another young African-American man by the California Highway Patrol. And it was like the floodgate, running loose years of tension in the black community that were the result of real estate segregation, widespread poverty, terrible schools. The National Guard was called in, but Watts was in utter turmoil. <coughs> So a group of black clergymen from the neighborhood sent word to Dr. King. They pled for his help, saying they knew that a visit from such a famous <coughs> leader would bring national attention to the situation and might diffuse it. So King, who desperately needed that vacation, said okay and jumped on a plane to Los Angeles. He met with the white politicians in California as well as the black clergymen and other community leaders in Watts. And then he took a tour. He walked through the neighborhood on foot with folks who lived there. And as the biographer David J. Carroll recounts, he found the material and spiritual desolation that shattered the lives of millions of black citizens trapped in America's ghettos. So that night, Dr. King sat in a motel room and debriefed the day with his close friend, Bayard Rustin. The two had worked together for years with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, but they had found themselves at odds for the last several years over the direction, <coughs> the next step in the civil rights movement. Rustin had been insisting for the last few years that they would fail. The movement would fail if they continued to focus uniquely on race without also bringing in issues of class and economic justice. King had largely dismissed this idea. He was content to stick with specific issues like school busing and housing, integration and voting rights. But after walking through Watts, King had sort of a conversion experience. He went back to the hotel that night and he said, Baird, you know, I work to get these people the right to eat hamburgers at the lunch counter. And now I've got to do something to get them the money to buy them. Just a few weeks after that <coughs> visit to Watts, King and other leaders of the SCLC finalized their plans to begin what they called a Northern Campaign, starting with a pilot program in Chicago. King said, I have faith that Chicago could well become the metropolis where a meaningful nonviolent movement could arouse the conscience of this nation to deal realistically <clears throat> with the northern ghetto. At the same time, they knew that the northern fight would be very different and potentially even more difficult than what the SCLC had done in the south. In Chicago, racism wasn't codified in the laws. Mayor Daley was no George Wallace. The police chief was no Bull Connor. Whites were generally sympathetic, at least in word, to the civil rights cause. And there were fewer obvious symptoms of racism. So the Chicago Freedom Movement represented a total shift in focus and organizing techniques. In Selma and in Birmingham, King and the SCLC had deliberately simplified the issues. They, concent they concentrated on very particular and often very symbolic goals, integrating lunch counters, for example. But the Chicago problem, as they called it, was more nuanced. It is simply a matter of economic exploitation, King said. Every condition exists simply because someone profits by its existence. This economic exploitation is crystallized in the slum, whose purpose it is to confine those who have no power and perpetuate their powerlessness. The slum is little more than a domestic colony, which leaves its inhabitants dominated politically, exploited economically, and segregated 
and humiliated at every turn. We must organize this total community into units of political and economic power. Unfortunately, it was much harder to get wide support from, for the redistribution of wealth and complex economic reform than it had been to convince people that mowing down children with fire horses and attack dogs was wrong. Adding an economic focus to the racial justice work of the SCLC represented an incredible threat to the status quo of the white power structure in a way that desegregation did not. As King remarked, it didn't cost the nation one penny to integrate lunch counters. It didn't cost the nation one penny to guarantee the right to vote. <coughs> the problems we are facing will cost the nation billions of dollars. Dr. King's analysis of the intersection of race and class continued to evolve over the last three years of his life. He also became increasingly public about his opposition to the Vietnam War. He argued that the three evils of racism, classism, and militarism were inextricably linked and that you couldn't address one without squarely facing up to the other. As his understanding became more nuanced and he argued more publicly against this trifecta of American evil, Dr. King lost significant support. Not just from white people who had formerly supported his civil rights work, but from many of the black <coughs> leaders who had been the backbone of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference for the past decade. Yet Dr. King felt a moral and an ethical responsibility to speak his prophetic truth, whatever the consequences. Our reading from today came from Dr. King's controversial last sermon, which he preached on March 31st, 1968, five days before he was assassinated in the National Cathedral in Washington. The Poor People's Campaign was set to launch shortly thereafter. But on April 4th, King was assassinated in Memphis. The campaign still launched in May, but it ended after a disastrous six-week span. Momentum never built. The media didn't pay any attention to the campaign. And it became what some have called the SCLC's Little Bighorn, dying a tragic death along with Dr. King. This April will mark the 45th anniversary of Dr. King's assassination. There is no doubt that we live in a different world, a world that was profoundly changed by the civil rights movement and its aftermath. After all, the same city that produced the Lawndale slums of the 1960s is now the hometown of America's first black president, a president who will be inaugurated to his second term tomorrow on King Day. And yet, those intertwined structures of evil, racism, classism, and militarism, have changed very little in the last century, last half century. We no longer see news footage of police releasing attack dogs on African Americans protesting housing segregation. But we do know that the vast majority of subprime mortgages and predatory lending practices that led to the collapse of the housing market were targeted toward people of color who systematically have been denied access to credit over the past several decades. African Americans are no longer legally prohibited from owning land or real estate or businesses, but we know that <coughs> almost half of the wealth in this country is concentrated in the hands of only 1% of Americans, and that 97% of that section of our population is white. There are no longer state and federal laws prohibiting people of color from exercising their right to vote. But we know that voting rights are revoked as a result of incarceration. And while people of color make up only about 30% of the national population, they are disproportionately arrested and sentenced, making up more than 60% of the prison population. There's no longer a draft or a war in Vietnam but we know that military recruiting is huge in communities of color. 
where young people face unemployment, educational disadvantage, student loan debt, and a lack of economic mobility that does not exist in the same way in white communities. And there is no longer a significant dialogue about race and disparity <coughs> in our country. Rather, we have dog whistle politics, racially coded tax debates, and the greatest racial wealth disparity that this country has ever seen. Looking at all of this, it's hard to argue that we're actually much better off than we were half a century ago. This is hard stuff. It is hard, obviously, for the people of color who experience that sort of coded racism every day. And it's hard to acknowledge for white folks who find themselves complicit in the system. It's just as explosive and inflammatory and complex as it was 50 years ago, but in our post-civil rights Obama era, the dominant culture has taught us that it's not okay to talk about race anymore, that we're supposed to be colorblind, that we'll offend someone if we bring up this divisive topic. It's still easier for us to focus on individual discrete issues like gun control or health insurance or educational standards than it is to look at that vast intertwined morass of issues that spring out of that toxic soil of racial and economic injustice. We are left overwhelmed and tired and wondering if there is any hope for fixing that system. For me, that point of bleak despair is exactly the moment when I most need to remember that Dr. King was not just a political leader, but a deeply religious man, too. A man whose belief in the radical social teachings of Jesus and the Hebrew prophets <coughs> compelled him to incarnate his beliefs throughout his life. A man who had a personal relationship with a God he knew deep in his heart stood on the side of love and justice. A man who saw himself not as a messiah, but as a small part of a long struggle that began long before his birth and would continue long after his death. A man who believed that the only path toward salvation was commitment to that which reason fears is not attainable, but the spirit knows is not negotiable. In that same sermon preached five days before his death, Dr. King said, on some positions, cowardice asks the question, is it expedient? And then expedience comes along and asks the question, is it politic? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? And conscience asks the question, <coughs> is it right? There comes a time, he said, when one must take the position that is neither safe nor popular but he must do it because conscience tells him it is right. I believe today that there is a need for all people of goodwill to come with a massive act of conscience and say in the words of the old Negro spiritual, we ain't gonna study war no more. He meant war in foreign nations, yes. But he also meant racial war. He meant economic war, war against any entire community of people Poor people, people of color, LGBTQ people, immigrants, women, children, any group that simply wants to collect on that great promissory note of America. So how do we honor Dr. King's legacy and refuse to study war no more? How do we keep that broad picture of you and refuse to get sucked in and blinded by whatever issue du jour comes up? How do we build solidarity across our differences, <clears throat> refusing to let the structures of oppression lead us to believe that greatest of heresies, that the interest of each of us is not the same thing as the interest of all of us? There's no blueprint, not for individuals or congregations. There's not a single one protest we can attend or book study we can do or sermon I could preach that would be the visionary direction to start to, skip, to tip those scales toward justice. 
But Dr. King would say that it matters that we do something, that we act here and now, refusing to be paralyzed by the great monolith of injustice that stands before it, that instead we stand at its foundations and chip away with whatever chisel we have in our hands. That's the organizing principle behind the new campaign from standing on the side of love. You know the people with the yellow t-shirts? They're calling it 30 Days of Love, our spiritual journey for social justice. It's a month of action and service and education and reflection that began yesterday, January 19th, and will run through February 17th. They've created a calendar of suggestions for actions that individuals and communities can do throughout the month, ranging from participating in a free webinar about combating anti-Muslim bigotry to organizing a letter writing campaign in support of reproductive justice, to becoming a pen pal to an LGBTQ person who is incarcerated. Of course, you can do your own actions with your family or community. 1,500 people across the country have already taken the pledge to participate in 30 Days of Love. And more sign up every day. I've taken the pledge and I encourage you to do so as well. You can go to standingonthesideoflove.org or to our Open Circle Facebook page where there is a link to the pledge. Sign your name, join with UUs and other people across the country to work to bring that vision of radical love into our broken world. And then tell people about it. Tell people what you're doing. Share with us on the Facebook page. Invite other people to join you in whatever small act you can do. My friends, our salvation lies in our ability to remind one another that we are, in Dr. King's words, caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. That's the purpose of building the beloved community that Dr. King talked so much about to learn hard truths in community, to hold one another's hands as we move forward, to restore one another's souls when we fall down, to be for one another that persistent voice of conscience that asks again and again, is it right? One of Dr. King's favorite phrases was a paraphrase of something that the 19th century Unitarian minister Theodore Parker often said. He said, we shall overcome because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. May we never forget that ours are the hands that do the bending. May it be so. Blessed be, ashe, and amen. For our closing hymn, we will sing number 140.